Hello, welcome to another Geotech Hour. I'm your host, Dr. David Bray, inaugural director of the Atlantic Council's Geotech Center, and we have a very exciting conversation assembled today to talk about synthetic data, privacy, and the future of trust. Now, this conversation builds off a partnership that we've had over the last year with our partners at Accenture, where we did a series of six data salons. The six data salons focused on bringing together peers in terms of data science, those who were interested in actually applying it to make the world better, and thinking about the ethics of data as we work together. You can find those videos. We've now actually posted them online. And this conversation is to carry it forward as we address the conversation of synthetic data and how it can be used to address questions about privacy and enhancing the future of trust. And to join us as one of the first panelists, I'd like to actually welcome one of our panelists, who is Stephen, who actually, with Accenture, helped us do today's salon. So Stephen, if I could ask you one quick to real quick introduce yourself, and then two, maybe sort of, could you tell us, well, what is synthetic data and, and how can it actually help us address questions about privacy and trust? Thank you, David. Hi, I'm Stephen Thiel. I lead uh, Responsible Innovation at Accenture, and I, I'm also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Geotech Center. Um, maybe if I could take your question and, and backwards, uh, the last part first. You know, the, the, the two things that we really see as drivers for synthetic data, I, I'll look at both industry and kind of a, a you know, regulatory side of things, if you will. So the first is we see strong demand in, in banking. Um, this is for things such as anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, uh, interbank collaborations, improving equitable access to capital, uh, things like that. Um, we also see a strong interest in healthcare, and this is really around the ability to share data, ability to do deep insights. And then um, the regulatory side of things, you know, we're, we're seeing that, that a, a changing landscape of privacy policy around the world is, is causing a lot of organizations to look for, you know, how do I really go beyond? How do I have this not be an impediment to my business, but maybe a strategic uh, enabler for, for, you know, my business being able to carry on where there might be barriers to entry for others? And synthetic data can provide that by, by really, you know, kind of sidestepping a lot of the, the privacy concerns because there is no uh, personal information or personally identifiable information, you know, within that synthetic data set. And then on the, the trust side, you know, how synthetic data helps to build trust is that, you know, one, it's privacy preserving. Um, there is no information about individuals that is, is uh, contained within those, those synthetic data sets. Um, it also allows for things like statistical testing of fairness, for data sharing, um, as I said before, without private information being exchanged and some other benefits as well. So there's a lot of you know, compelling reasons to look at it um, and particularly so in specific industries. Excellent, and I appreciate that really sort of illustrating why it's important and how it matters. And, and maybe real quick, if I could ask you a real quick rejoinder, Stephen. So, if we, if we look at it, that synthetic data is really, again, as you said, it doesn't have any personal identifiable information, but it's still actionable and useful. What are you seeing in terms of drivers in the marketplace that, that actually sort of, you know, you mentioned some what you're seeing in banking and things like that, but are there other drivers that you're seeing that's creating demand signals here? Yeah, I, I think too that, you know, without the regulatory side, without the specific industries, what we see is that a lot of um, you know, people, specifically younger people who have joined organizations in the last few years are really holding their, their employers to a higher standard. Um, they're saying, you know, there's technology out there. Yes, it is, it is kind of cutting edge, um, but there are ways that we can do things better. And synthetic data is simply, you know, one of the tools in the toolbox of doing things better. Excellent. Well, thank you, Stephen, for everything that you do as a positive change agent with data. And I look forward to diving deeper with you as we talk about this with the other panelists. And that's a good segue now to Stuart. Stuart, real quick, if you could introduce yourself. And, and you've written a book in which you talk about synthetic data as being the perfect privacy storm. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about, once you introduce yourself, about that book and, and why you think it's really the perfect storm when it comes to privacy? Sure, thanks, David. So last year, I served as a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. And I had the privilege to spend the entire year doing a deep dive into digital privacy policy and all of its ramifications. So the perfect storm is really a metaphor, if you will, for all of the different forces that are now coalescing in terms of the policy community and thinking about 
digital privacy. So beginning in 2018, the European Union enacted the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the umbrella privacy regulation that's now being implemented by the individual states of the EU. And now that we have Brexit, the UK will be undergoing a comparable process of enforcement, even though it's not technically part of the GDPR. Then in 19, 2019, California enacted the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. And that was the probably the broadest federal or statewide act in the United States. In part, it looks a bit like the GDPR, but it has a number of other elements in it. And that began a momentum of states. So we now have 20 states which are considering or have enacted uh, digital privacy laws. Most recently, we have the state of Maine enacting. There is a privacy bill on the desk of the governor of Virginia, which is expected to be signed very soon. And most critically, some of our largest states, including New York, Texas, uh, Florida, Illinois, and Pennsylvania, have initiated some legislative act of, uh, activities in the area. So what we see is a lot of activity at the state level. And of course that leaves the federal level. So in the 116th Congress, which was the most recent Congress, there were four pieces of legislation that were introduced in this area. Very interestingly, introduced by Republicans and Democrats, but there's no bipartisan consensus. And so we have separate bills from the individual parties. We also have two legislative drafts. And of course, since March of last year, we have COVID-19, which really, I think, underscores the intensity of data use. Obviously, we're all working at home and living our lives at home as well. And so we have more people now who are sending and storing and transmitting uh, personal information. And so really we have a sort of a tsunami of information which continues to well up. So where does that put synthetic data? So as I've illustrated here, most of the policy discussion has been in the area of legislation and regulation. And I think synthetic data has the possibility to broaden this conversation, not just in terms of what I call a stick approach, but also to a carrot approach, to the idea that the private sector, or maybe the private sector in conjunction with the public sector, can come up with solutions, which obviously are going to be very privacy protective and consistent with all of these legislative goals, yet they may not involve this carrot or the stick of regulation and further enforcement. So that's the relationship between synthetic data and digital privacy policy. And I think one of the things that needs to be done is there needs to be a greater discussion now between the privacy policy community and the people who are involved in synthetic data. Because my perception is that the policy community doesn't quite understand all of the technical and other ramifications of synthetic data, but I'm very positive about it. That's very good framing of, of what we face here in the United States. And I really liked how, Stuart, you were saying that, again, that this could actually be a carrot as opposed to a stick. And, and actually, if the private sector seized on it, uh, it's better to shape the future as opposed to have the future forced upon you. Um, so, so maybe if I could ask you real quick, if you were to try and make a very short pitch to a CEO as to why they should actually embrace synthetic data now, as opposed to waiting to see what, what, what's done to you in terms of legislation, if you had a real quick short elevator pitch, what would be your pitch to a private sector CEO to, to, as to why they should embrace it now? Well, we see that first of all, it works. And so that's a very positive concept that you're not really doing things experimentally. And, and second, of course, we see that there are interesting developments around the world. For example, in Australia, we have a great pilot project now with MasterCard, Australia Post, and Deakin University to pilot elements of synthetic data. So what's interesting is you can not only talk about this technically in 
theory, but you can begin to talk about pilots. And from the CEO perspective, I think one thing that could be done quite soon is to begin to initiate pilot projects in the area. Excellent. Well, I, I really appreciate you highlighting that. It was a really good pitch, Stuart. And hopefully some folks are listening and will be listening to this because we'd like to obviously help bring the future forward and, and actually have it be things where people are leading by the carrot model. So I appreciate that, Stuart. That's a good segue now to our friends uh, up in the north uh, with Krista, longtime friend of the Geotech Center, also a senior fellow with us. And, and I know Canada, as I understand right now, is looking at privacy and, and, and reshaping privacy. So maybe if you could real quick share for our audience what's happening there and, and where you see possible opportunities as Canada thinks about reshaping privacy, identity management, and, and synthetic data as well, Krista. Absolutely. Thanks, David. So as you mentioned, uh, we are currently undergoing a review of our Privacy Act in Canada. And I loved hearing Stuart talk about GDPR and the work that's happening around the world, because so much of that actually started in Canada with Anne Kavukian, who's been recognized as kind of the godmother of privacy by design. So, so much of her mm -hmm. framework is what first started here in Canada and then was taken into GDPR and, and around the world. And so we've really had this idea of that privacy centric model at the core of so much of our innovation here. And I get really excited when we start talking about synthetic data because where we're really seeing innovation happening is in the healthcare sector. And we know from research that we've done that this is a space where people are very protective of their personal data for obvious reasons, but where there's a huge potential in the synthetic data to help move and advance research, especially in things like rare diseases. So um, actually just back in October, we had a major piece of research that came out with Health, uh, Health City and the Institute for Health Economics out in Alberta, where they're doing some major data sets around synthetic um, data. And I'm personally really excited about a project that's been funded through a national program called our, uh, our super clusters. We've got a digital super cluster and there's a project in there called Trust Sphere. Okay. And this is a partnership to your point on public, private and, uh, and nonprofit. This is between the BC Children's Hospital, Secure Key, and Identos looking at type 1 diabetes and starting to create data trust there and approaching this idea of data donors. And if we take that idea of data donors and then extrapolate that into synthetic data, we start to get to this idea of what could we do that is privacy enhancing that enables us to do research into highly vulnerable populations. Here we're talking about kids and illness. So uh, it's, it's something that we haven't traditionally wanted to touch at scale and nobody wants to hold that data set because of the liability. Then we're starting to get into some really exciting potential around these use cases. So while like Stephen, I love the, the financial services application, I get really excited about the healthcare implications and where this can go. Um, I have a little girl who lives up the street from me who has SMA an extremely rare disease with populations around the world and the treatment for this is a vaccine that is several millions of dollars and it is heartbreaking to see parents trying to fundraise for that and that's where synthetic data could come in if we could start to create these data sets that are anonymized around the world and reduce the cost of research we could be leveraging these tools to make a massive impact on the healthcare center so those are the places that i get really excited about and i'm seeing our our privacy legislation aligned to start to understand that privacy can actually be an enabler of innovation. I think synthetic data is one of those examples rather than a barrier. And to those who are listening, I'd say, how might you think about privacy as that enabler of innovation as opposed to the barrier? Excellent. Well, very well said, Chris. And then you're absolutely, I mean, I'm similarly like with you, is that we, you know, it, it, even though nobody wants to necessarily touch the data of this is the sensitivity level of children if we don't address this and maybe synthetic data obviously clearly is a way that we can do it to actually make it safer we're not going to be able to actually bring down the cost of researching cures and making these cures affordable so that's very well framed as, 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 as a value proposition so so maybe for our audience that you know I know I know you and I've had conversations in the past about data trust and data co-ops but for our audience that may not know about it real quick could you maybe share what a data trust or data co-op is and how synthetic data might actually be formed as a part of of a data co-op or data trust? Absolutely. So a data trust is where you have large groups of individuals who are effectively becoming data donors. So you're contributing your data into a data set for researchers to use within a prescribed mandate. And that is critical. Um, we've certainly had cases here in Canada where data has been given, or in fact, blood has been given for one intended purpose, and then it's been used for other things. What's exciting about this is if you contain that data trust within a specific framework, 
you have the ability to say, I allow my data to be used in this way, but not in that way. And potentially I can recall my data. For, so for these youth whose parents may be giving their data, when they turn 18, they may have the ability to actually call that data back. Hmm. Take that a step further into synthetic data, then we can take out that known identity, those personal identifiers, and create basically a lookalike data set that researchers can then use, knowing that it's based on real life data, but no longer identifiable to an individual. And that gives longer use case to those data sets. So it gets really exciting, especially that combination of data trusts and synthetic data. Wow. And I can only imagine for data scientists, they can then use the synthetic data with, with a little bit more confidence that they don't necessarily have all the tripwires that would come if this was actually like truly people's private health records and things. Well, it's, it's both, I think David, it's both that. It doesn't have the tripwires of personal data, but it also, you avoid some of the biases that come if we use pure AI generated data sets. Right. So there's, there's an interesting balance there that tends to give us at least hopefully slightly less bias. Very well said. Well, well, thank you for that, Krista. Look forward to diving deeper with you. And now we'd actually like to welcome to the show a um, friend of the Geotech Center and, and someone we hope to get involved more with the events that we're doing. So Jacqueline, real quick, could you introduce yourself? And you're coming to us from South Africa. So one, we appreciate you making the time zone jump uh, to join us for the live show here today. And two, what are you seeing on the African continent that involving synthetic data and how it might have beneficial applications uh, in the region there as well? Hi, hi, thanks, David, um, and thanks to the Geotech Center. Um, so I'm a lawyer by background, and a lot of my work in recent years has really been advising African governments on various technology-related uh, laws. Um, and so I guess something that I am seeing across the continent is a lot more countries thinking deeper about privacy, um, about cybersecurity, and the like, in part just because, you know, proliferation of the internet, um, in part really trying to start thinking forward about how to set up locations to attract investment in technology. So we see Silicon Savannah in Kenya, but also here in South Africa and Nigeria, very strong potential hubs to attract investment. Um, now, from a regulatory reform perspective, at the moment, there are about 17 out of 55 countries that have privacy laws. So still a long way to go, but all that to say there is work in motion. Um, I think what we're trying to work on, uh, not only as far as not only getting the laws in place, but also making sure that there is this balance between you know, government trying to regulate, but also making sure that the environment doesn't stifle innovation. And so that's something that um, we've been working really hard on to say, it's okay to legislate, but make sure, you know, we can attract investment and people here can really innovate for good. Um, on the synthetic data aspect, unfortunately, not too many use cases from the continent, but that's why I think this, this conversation is really exciting because, um, from a financial services perspective, uh, we've seen with the rise of M-Pesa just a lot more financial innovation across the continent. Financial inclusion and financial health are huge topics, uh, not only from a development perspective, but also from an investment perspective. And so I really hope that this conversation can start to spur more conversation on the continent about how we can use synthetic data to come up with more useful um, products and services. Same thing from a health perspective. Unfortunately, we're laden with some of the hardest um, diseases and fastest spreading diseases on the continent. And I do think that now is a perfect time, even as we're dealing with COVID-19, to really put the application of synthetic data to some of the other diseases that we've been battling with over time. Um, just a few other things that I guess I'm seeing here on the continent um, is just kind of, as other parts of the world, so for instance, the EU and GDPR and the US really come up with um, privacy laws. The question is, what's the applicability here? <laughs> um, and I think that idea of, you know, how does this apply to us is one that a lot of jurisdictions are really still trying to figure out. Um, so this idea of kind of cross-continental compliance, um, I think is one that really has a lot of us just questioning. We don't yet have data, for instance, um, on whether there have been any uh, breaches as far as GDPR and you know 
um, let me say companies on the continent, but that's an area that we're really looking forward to, to really saying, how can we, as we develop legal systems, how can we learn, but also collaborate with other parts of the world? Excellent. Very well said, Jacqueline. And, 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 and not to put you on a spot, but you know, we've heard from the new president of the United States that he's thinking about holding a summit of democracies sometime later this year. And obviously, a lot of democracies present in Africa. If you were to recommend, you know, whether it be financial inclusion or some other topic, some topics that, that you think should be brought to that summit of democracies from, from the perspective that you have as a lawyer, but also what you're seeing in the region, what might be some things that you might actually elevate as, as ideas for that topic and that agenda? I think one of the main areas is, as we talk about governance in general, I think there's kind of a question of how do we define what African democracy is? Um, I think we've kind of used the textbook of democracy from outside Africa, but what we've seen over time is that governance processes have evolved. Uh, people started off thinking that, you know, democracy was just voting, but now is a perfect time to really engage people to understand what good governance is. And I think with respect to technology, what we're seeing is with the open data movement um, increasing across the continent, as governments really decide to engage with their populations online by choice or by force, you know, through the use of social media, what we're starting to see is kind of more engagement. And so I think it would be important to really have a conversation about peace and security, democracy as it relates to kind of where we are at this point, but also the role of technology in engaging people, especially young people. I mean, a majority of the continent is under the age of 35. By 2050, you know, um, by 2050, over half of the continent will be under the age of 25. So scary statistics about the youth bulge and the youth are online and the youth are engaging with one another. It's about time that we used technology and governments and kind of put everyone in the same conversation to make sure that all of our expectations are managed, but also government really starts to figure out how to best deliver to citizens. Very well said, and, 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 and I was inspired by what you said that we used to think democracy was just about, you know, exercising your vote, but in fact, what we may be realizing is, especially in the era in which we're now interconnected and we're producing data, but we're also using technology, there's a lot of rethinking about what that entails too. So very well said, Jacqueline. And that's a good segue, to, and by the way, I would remind our audience, please ask your questions, uh, both if you're watching on, on, on live stream, please send your questions either through the Zoom chat, if you're on the Zoom chat, or via social media through our Twitter account at AC Geotech. Uh, and that, that builds up to our, our, our last panelist, but definitely uh, one that we want to hear from. So, so Mike Caps, if you could real quick share both who you are and what is Diveplane, and then to give us your thoughts about, again, we've talked a little bit about why CEOs should care, but maybe even more, uh, your thoughts about why CEOs should be excited about synthetic data. Sure. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Mike Caps. I'm a, a reformed video game developer, built games like Fortnite and the like, and uh, decided to do something a little bit more productive. So focusing on uh, explainable AI and synthetic data. So um, we're the folks building this sort of technology. And Chris, to call me afterwards, I would be delighted to help you build a synthetic data lake for your problems. It's exactly what needs to be done. And uh, the price is free for what you're working on. So um, when you talk about CEOs and why they should care, I mean, this is the pitch I have to make all the time, right? You know, it's great to say, let's preserve privacy. But, you know, that's cool. But if nobody's regulating me, what's the carrot uh, if there's not a stick yet? And, you know, by God, keep working on the sticks team. But until that happens. Um, so one is internal use. Uh, just talking to a finance company who's facing fraud in Germany and fraud in France, but can't work between those two anti-fraud teams because of the regulations between just moving data between those two organizations within the same company. Um, so being able to move synthetic data across that barrier is really useful. And for sure, it's the same between the New York and the Singapore office or whatever else. And just the simplicity, it's like in the military, uh, if you could work with unclassified data, you want to, because it just makes your life easier. You don't have to scan your eyeball before you go touch the stuff. Um, and then uh, sort of next step is moving to external friendlies. Uh, imagine you've got a great contractor who can help you solve this problem in an instant, but you're a healthcare organization in the United States. So you just need them to go through a year long BAA process before they can see it. Uh, what if you just hand them some data that has no risk of privacy leak, toss it on your website, 
In fact, all comers, anyone who wants to download it and try to solve our problem, we will pay you on the other end. That's totally feasible right now. Um, and, uh, and I would say external sales is next. When you talk about the million dollar shot for SMA, one of the ways we can make pharma more effective and ideally less expensive or move money into healthcare is to have a hospital be able to monetize their data set without any risk of privacy when they sell their, say, imagine St. Jude Children's Hospital could sell their child research data to a pharmacy company or just give it away if that's what they wanted to do, depending on their mission or their financial needs. Um, pretty cool stuff. Um, the stick is theoretical, but it's coming fast, which mm -hmm. is we all hear the stories about re-identification. You know, you, oh, there's no way we scratched off every serial number, social security number, address, phone number from this data set, but it happened to include the check-in and check-out time at the hospital, which can be re-identified if you match it up to phone records. Oops, we just leaked tons of personal data. We never could have foreseen this, except anyone could have foreseen that. And the question of liability in that case, when we're all punditing about it right now, it's gonna be hard for a CEO to say, we never could have foreseen that when we put that data out there that there was a privacy risk. So I think the stick is coming. So uh, there you go. Very well said. So, so, so I guess I have, I have two, a two-part question, Mike, is, is first, um, Tell me a little bit about your journey. I mean, how did you get here from video games to this? I'd like to, I think the audience would like to hear a little bit more about that. And then two, um, you know, what sort of demonstration projects are you doing or could we do that could actually get the attention of state legislatures, national governments and things like that so they buy into this? Got it. Uh, okay, so video game journey. Um, well, it's great to make a lot of money in video games first um, before you decide to go into solving important problems for the world. Uh, but you know, honestly, my experience with AI was fairly limited in video game space. My background is in computer graphics, uh, and so. Uh, when we develop AI, uh, if a monster is running away from you, it could be because there's a bug, because it's afraid of the player, because it's regrouping with its friends to come back at you aggressively. And how do you know what's going on? Well, it, we'd have it tell us. It'd be very transparent, big flag over its head of what it's doing. And then as I got into what's really going on in AI in the world, it's the exact opposite of that, where nobody has any idea whether that system is shallowly learning or buggy or amazing. And that scared the bejesus out of me. Uh, and so really that's the, the start was getting into explainable machine learning, building technology that's fully transparent. Well, one of the neat things, we've built this cool platform, which some other day we'll talk about. One of the neat things about it is it's really good at encapsulating knowledge from a small data set, which turns out to be just what you need for data synthesis. So I didn't get into the data privacy business. We just happened to build a really good solution that's really easy to use. So I. How can you not proliferate something that helps data privacy? That's that's my data, my kids' data. Um, so, uh, so that was one, and then I can't even remember question number two. What was question it? number two is so if, if 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 you know if policymakers need to see something to actually believe it. So, what are either things you're doing, or what are things that we could do as demonstration projects to to sort of capture the imagination of staffers, members in government, and things like that. Well, so, um, you know, I just got off a call with a couple ex secretaries of defense, and there's a lot of interest in the um, sort of human services, defense, and um, sort of protection side of the government. Imagine the next Katrina or the next COVID. So what could we have done beforehand to have those be less impactful and that our country could be more resilient? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest actually in synthetic data lakes because the Johnsons and Johnsons, well, you know, MasterCards, any of the companies that wouldn't mind sharing their data in an emergency don't want to share it all the time. And how do you manage that, which is sort of what Chris is tackling. Imagine they can just put their synthetic data in and say, this may not be, for example, all of the Samsung IoT information from my great state of North Carolina for everyone. That would be super private information. But if it was a synthesized version of that, and then when we have a problem, whether it's a COVID or a hurricane or whatever, that would be a wealth of information to feed to first responders uh, or DHS. And so I think there's a lot of interest. If we can't solve the problem the way we'd want to, then how do we solve it? And then synthetic data is, I, I've been talking to senators about it, which is just where it needs to be. So I'm pretty Excellent. Excited. Well, and, and on that note, I mean, if you're open to it later, we have a geotech commission that does have Senator Mark Warner uh, from Virginia, Senator Rob Portman from Ohio, and we're producing recommendations for them. So if you can spare just a little bit, we'd love to actually have your recommendations feed in that as well. It's I know my full-time job. I'm delighted to. No All problem. right. Well, I appreciate it. So, so thank you for that, Mike. And now we'd actually like to welcome a longtime friend of the geotech center going back even before the geotech center was a geotech center, Jeff Frazier. 
who is also a senior fellow. He is actually, he's been instrumental in actually pulling together this panel and he actually has the first question. So over to you, Jeff, with the first sort of question for the panelists here. Today. Well, they, they've already covered all the terrific <laughs> topics. Um, I, I, the, uh, thank you, David. You put together really a terrific group of experienced opinion leaders on the topic. Uh, it's a growing top, uh, certainly a, a, an important topic. Uh, a couple things. If uh, my question is more directed to to Dr. Caps, um, years ago, my I work my former boss. I worked for the chairman at Cisco, and he used to say, "Watch the leaders in a category move to other categories and understand why they do that." And so, if you're between the age of, you know, six and twenty six in the world you're familiar with uh, Epic Games or have an affinity for it, which in our, as parents, we know it as Fortnite. And so the, que the question with the, with the follow-up question was, uh, having successfully led a category in the industry and, and gaming, what did you see or what did you not see uh, in the role of data and advanced AI that made you want to lead a new category? And then the second, Part of that is, um, how do you see the commercial side of synthetic data forming? Because it's a, I think it's going to be a giant impact to all of our industries. And I'd just like to see what you're seeing early. Ooh, okay. Um, thanks for the question, Jeff. Uh, so I would say on the, what do I see happening in the marketplace? There's definitely leaders that have, let's just say, the discretionary budget to put into an effort like this to test because they see the value of it. I think that market's going to explode very quickly when the sticks come. Right now, it's it's still carrots. It's still forward-thinking organizations like a um, UBS or a MasterCard, whoever, that are doing this kind of work internally because they see the benefits, and a few healthcare organizations and the like that, that see the benefits, uh, governments. Uh, but boy, is that going to change really fast because almost every healthcare org I talk to uses really primitive masking technology, You know, literally just censoring with a black pen um, what they're doing. Um, and then you asked about the shift. You know, I'd say one of the things that I saw in video games that became really troubling to me is the shift went from, uh, I'll put it in movie terms because everybody here watches movies, the shift went from two hour really good movies to TikTok mm -hmm. and YouTube. And so what happened was the job was to monetize psychological warfare. Um, it's absolutely about reciprocity techniques to David gives Krista a gift in the game because we help him to do so and then she feels like she owes him one so she can't quit and now we've created this cycle of we're individualizing the sale per person for you Jeff it's 20 cents and for Jacqueline it's 15 cents or 30 cents depending on the day and your mood and we're watching all that it really presaged some of Cambridge Analytica and what you can do with data and people and that's not a really fun business for entertainment, right? I mean, that's become the game of video games. I was delighted to get away from that uh, and work on something a little bit more meaty, let's say. So uh, there you go. Well, thank you for your leadership. I like, really appreciate it. And thank you, Jeff, as well, um, for everything you're doing to help bring together thinking about how data and tech is changing the world and changing societies. Uh, I'm actually going to go to some of the additional questions we've gotten um, so far. We've got about three open ones. We've got some other ones we may circle back to. Uh, this one I actually want to go to Stephen on, which actually asks the question, um, from a data science perspective, how do you ensure that the data set is a representative of the original data set, um, recognizing it as a synthetic one? Yeah, actually, um, I think I think Mike is going to have a bunch better answer on that, so I'll, okay. I'll uh, push it over to him. Um, I, I've heard his answer to this, and I know it's better. So all right, sounds uh, good. Thank you, Stephen. Over to you, I'm, Mike. Then. I'm getting a lot of airtime here. I was I was literally typing in the background to answer that question. So I mean, I think representative is per purpose, right? It's a domain specific question. If what you're trying to say is, does it actually um, include all the mathematics of the original set? Most people care more about analyzing closeness of the synthetic set to the original set to make sure you haven't uh, crossed a boundary and you've actually put Dr. David Dre in your new set and anybody <laughs> can find that. Um, and so, you know, for example, if you're using this to train a neural net, uh, here's an example. We did a system for missile targeting where they wanted to use missile 
uh, trajectories to train a new missile AI? Well, you would train it with both the original set and the new set and see how would they performed. You know, was it useful enough? Because it was for a specific problem. And so that's the only measure of quality that mattered. And then we made sure the synthetic data was representative and not similar. And then you could train that AI and have no concerns this scary, yucky black box AI in the new system could ever leak the original classified data. Um, but uh, there's not a lot of uh, publications in that space. Um, it's relatively new. Um, so I would just say, make sure it solves the problem you're trying to solve as opposed to uh, there being a true answer. Very well and said. If, yeah. if maybe I could build on that just a little sure. bit. So, you know, one of the things that, that we've seen, I would say, you know, over the last decade or so with, with organizations adopting AI is, is one, um, it, is it fit for purpose, right? Do you actually need it here or are you just sprinkling it on because you like to sprinkle sprinkles everywhere and, and you know, you're, you're doing it for that reason. And then the second one is really, you know, what uh, along the lines of what Mike was saying is, is this notion, is it better than what, right? And this, again, this comes back to, to AI, right? If we have a, a system that we know is eh, it's about 40 or 60, 40 to 60% accurate, you know, without artificial intelligence. And now we're going to add AI in and we can juice that to say 70% accurate. It's still not very good, but it's better, much better maybe than what we had before. And so the question becomes in synthetic data, the same thing. Does it achieve the objective that you're doing and how, how closely does it achieve that objective? And in many cases, we're willing to sacrifice a, a little sliver of accuracy for the privacy preserving that it gives us, right? For the ability to transact data with other parties and that kind of thing. And so, you know, generally what we see is that there is a, a decline in accuracy. That's not always the case, but we see a, a decline. Is that decline a couple percent? Is that decline 20%? Um, you know, and these are case by case scenarios based upon what that data set looks like. But is it sufficient to do a good job on what we're trying to do and how do you measure that is, is really kind of the, that key metric. And then we can start diving into, you know, features of that um, uh, synthetic data set. Does it, you know, guarantee um, um, protection of classes? Does it give you uh, a furtherance toward the normative values of justice you're trying to optimize for? You know, how, do, how does it perform under different constraints and, and then that's really kind of what we want to look at for performance metrics as well as we as we kind of move further in this field, but there's so much opportunity for research. Very well said, Stephen. And if I could ask you a real quick rejoinder that I'm also going to ask Jacqueline, and then I'm going to go to Krista and Stuart with questions about AI and bias and fairness with AI. But for you, Stephen, and for Jacqueline, a question's come up about the possibility of people being paid for their use of data and how it might relate to synthetic data. Are there some examples out there? So I want to go to you first, Stephen. And then Jacqueline, I'd be interested in your thoughts about how this might relate to the African continent and how this might actually be a, a possibility to be considered there too. So first, over to you, Stephen. Thanks. Yeah, I, I answered this a little bit um, in text response. It's, I think it's a great question because we, you know, one of the, the things that we've looked at in the past is kind of, you know, data trusts for this purpose, right? If I'm a, if I'm a uh, data producer, I might want to disclose that data to a, a data trust so that others can use it, right? Maybe I own uh, 10 million IoT devices in the field and those could provide insights for a range of industries um, you know, how do I actually put that somewhere where those industries could benefit from that? Well, I might, I, I, I might be able to put that into a data trust or some type of an exchange. Um, but then on the micro scale, right, on the individual contributions, I think we saw, you know, when Microsoft bought LinkedIn, it was something, you know, the, the value, I want to say, per record was something like $6. Right, so, so we, we've actually been able to put a value on a single record in a very large data set. What does that look like, right? Those individuals did not get, get paid out some, uh, you know, restitution or, or, or remuneration for um, their data being part of that, but certainly their data added to the value of that data set. And so that is a very hard question. And I think that the, the notion of synthetic data, because synthetic data would not exist without that original data to inform it, it's just, it, it adds an obfuscation layer to an already very difficult problem. And so, you know, I, I think 
I don't have the answer. <laughs> but I think, but I think you did a very good exploring the space. And so I give you kudos for that, Stephen. So Jacqueline, you had been talking about, you know, the ideas of financial inclusion, financial uplift, but I'd be interested in your thoughts about how this might apply from what you're seeing in the region as well, please. I think it would be great, first of all, if there were the potential for people to get paid for their data. Unfortunately, at the moment, I don't think we're there yet. What we are seeing is, for instance, as you mentioned, financial inclusion, where people who typically were not included, did not have access to a bank account or any form of financial services, are now able to, for instance, um, use their phone records um, to determine you know, how bankable they'll really be or how credit worthy they'll be. And those credit, um, those credit scores are then used later on to allow them to access financial services. And so I do think going above and beyond that, the next level, if financial services institutions were actually able to then use that data and pay for it, I think that that would be great. Um, now, from an organizational perspective, I just think right now, unfortunately, it is too messy. And I don't think any of the bigger institutions right now, honestly, would want to you know, deal with it. Having said that, uh, what we are seeing is in countries like Rwanda, which are really kind of inviting um, tech investment in and are saying, if you investor X come to the country, we are considering ourselves can we say, a policy hub. We will work with you to create necess a necessary policy environment. And so in such a situation, I could see Rwanda saying, okay, besides data use, what else do we need? You know, consent for portability, you know, payment and the like, um, the right to delete it whenever you need to. Um, and also pay. So I think that could be an interesting case in a country like Rwanda that's really trying to think forward. Um, but otherwise, I think it is a good challenge and a good challenge to the private sector here on the continent to really figure out if there is a way of paying X amount for data used. Because at the moment, unfortunately, a lot of people whose data is being collected um, is either being collected without their consent and if their consent is gotten, a lot of it is then used and people don't know what their data is being used for. And there's no way of really holding companies responsible. Very well said. And I appreciate that, Jacqueline. And, and uh, we can look to the future. Maybe we need to start doing a demonstration project to help sort of the, overcome that bystander effect where everybody thinks it's useful. But like you said, we have to galvanize people. So Stuart, I'd like to go to you. And then to Krista, uh, a question about, you know, concerns about data biased or, or there being, we actually have a question from Pat, who's actually asking about various biases in terms of either race, gender, ethnicity, or age uh, in the data set that we should be aware of here. And so I'd be interested first, Stuart, in your thoughts about, you know, what are you seeing in terms of either concerns there? Um, are legislatures starting to show concerns as well to make sure the data sets are representative? I'd be interested in your thoughts, Stuart, in terms of what you're seeing in trends in that space. Sure, so David, uh, there have been very interesting developments, uh, particularly in the area of facial recognition. And obviously during the past year or so with some of the situations we've had around the country, we've had more police forces and law enforcement now involved in thinking about or purchasing facial recognition systems. And we've seen some of the data which shows that in terms of being able to identify or misidentify based on racial categories, for example, uh, it tends to be about a 30% error rate. So mm. obviously that's a major policy concern for many uh, cities in particular. In, in California, for example, both San Francisco and Oakland have banned the use of facial recognition by law enforcement. And in Massachusetts, Boston has as well, in addition to a number of smaller cities, Massachusetts may become the first state in the country to essentially prohibit facial recognition by law enforcement. Uh, and then in New York City, for example, we had some proposals last year dealing with private landlords, whether or not they could use facial recognition in terms of swapping out their existing key systems for a facial recognition system. There was a proposal that in fact, they would not be able to do that. They would have to stay with a manual key system. So I think there's going to be a lot of activity in this area. And we see the data showing us that 
although the systems are improving, when you have a 30% error rate, it certainly shows that there are real issues here. And obviously that also creates the great window potentially for synthetic data, which can improve that error rate. Very well said, and I appreciate that, Stuart. And I think that's a good. This is it's a good overview of both the space we're in, and then the solutions that synthetic data can do to try and overcome some of those challenges. And that's a good setup for Krista. So, Krista, I was going to go to you because there was a question that was similar to the question about AI bias, but we also just got one from longtime friend of the Geotech Center, who you know well too, Divya. Divya is actually asking a question about India and their biometric system. But I know, for example, you've been very instrumental in thinking about identity management in the context of, of Canada and how we can make sure that it's done in such a way that is protected, that we're not revealing too much data. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts about what can we learn from Canada that might inform India or other places in the world as well. Absolutely. Um, so there's one thing that we've been talking about here that I find interesting is we're saying my data. And that's one of the things we think we have to challenge to start with is, is it my data or is it data about me? And so part of the context that we're looking at is it's data about me. And if we take, because it's very difficult to prove what is purely my data. Um, so if we start talking about data about me, then that starts to fit within a framework conversation of what are the privacy rules we want around it? How do we want to manage it? What are some of the governance rules that we want to think about? In Canada, we've created something called the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework. And that's been a collaboration between the government and the private sector coming together to create a framework based on privacy by design that says interoperability is the key component here. We are not trying to find a single solution that is going to work in all jurisdictions and across all platforms. What we do want to find is a common framework that we can all agree to that will allow interoperability A within Canada, but I mean, it's probably probably the nature of Canada being bilingual and being just north of the US, we tend to be international by perspective. So we look and say, how does this work not just within our federation, but also on an international basis? So the standards and frameworks that we've been looking at has been with that lens of interoperability and considering I think probably our indigenous population has had an influence on this is looking at it not just at an individual level but looking at a community level and I know David you had Dr. Tahu Kukatai on a while ago talking about indigenous data principles and how things like sharing medical information for the Maori in New Zealand is not a personal, it's not about my data. That is actually perceived to be data of the community. So then what right do I as an individual have to share that? Those are some of the things that we've been trying to build into these considerations. And, and those are big questions. I don't think we're gonna answer them right now, but to, to Divya and to others um, who are thinking about these questions, we need to think about it less as my data from an individualistic perspective and think more about data about me within a broader, context and then think about how do we create those interoperable systems because we're not going to find the single magic bullet and get everybody to agree to that it's just not going to happen very well said and, and i also want to give a shout out for the data salon that you did krista with us uh we'll definitely make sure we include it in the links from this episode because it was a very worthwhile watch and and what i like about what you're sharing is it is about thinking about interoperability recognizing there is not going to be one solution that fits them all and I, and I also liked how you elevated thinking about the indigenous uh, data communities approach. I believe they talk about their care standards in which the C stands for collectiveness and that we need to recognize that it is data about me, but it's part of a larger whole, especially when you start thinking about family data or DNA data. It's really about people beyond just ourselves. So colleagues, we are now at the lightning round and the lightning round is the last 10 minutes where I go to each of you and I ask you each for your two to three tweet length answers as to what you would recommend for either you know, the president, the, the G20, the head of the United Nations, CEOs, this is your chance to actually make your pitch as to what we do. And I'm gonna go first to Mike, um, and we're gonna go in reverse order of how we started. So I'm gonna go first to Mike and ask, what would be your two to three tweet, tweet links recommendations for different leaders in either the public or private sector based on what we've talked about today and the potential for synthetic data to be a huge uplift in people's lives? Got it. Um, so I'd say synthetic data techniques are available right now. You can buy them. There's 10 companies selling them. Um, so it's not distant future. And I would say be wary of the technology that we all know doesn't work. Black box shouldn't be used where it shouldn't be used. Masking shouldn't be used where it shouldn't be used. And I think we all know that and trying to get away with it's so maybe not the best plan. Very well said and very eloquent. Clearly, you have briefed leaders of the world before. We appreciate it, Mike, and we appreciate your insight. <laughs> 
look forward to having a deeper conversation with you about projects we can do together. That now is a good setup. Now we're going to go to Jacqueline. So what are your two to three tweet length recommendations for the leaders of the world as well? Okay, uh, mine are pretty simple. As countries, especially um, across emerging markets, continue to think about data, governments definitely need to factor in um, consumer protection and ethics considerations. Um, as much as we think about people in their human form, I think we need to think about people in their data form as well and not just put kind of numbers and algorithms, you know, they're people at the end of the day. Well I think the other part <laughs> is technology is changing fast. Uh, regulators are chasing innovators, uh, but I do think that there is a good opportunity now for regulators to work with innovators to make sure we get the law right and not have the law lag behind innovation. Um, I think the last one is really kind of um, collaboration, collaboration. I think this is a perfect opportunity as we all figure it out around the world to work together to figure it out. You know, whether it's in healthcare, financial services, COVID has taught us that we're all together in this fight. So I think there's also, you know, the opportunity now with synthetic data to work together. Very well said, we all stand together. And I wish we had more lawyers like you, Jacqueline, in your mindset, because uh, I think with, with, with that, we can take on any challenge in the world. So, so thank you. Uh, Krista, your chance for your two to three links, tweet link recommendations to world leaders. Uh, so a strong second to Jacqueline and the focus on ethics, just core to this entire conversation. Um, also designed for diversity. Uh, a big problem with AI generated samples before this conversation has been that they've been drawing off of non-diverse groups. So that design for diversity is going to be key. And really, let's start looking at data trust. What gets me excited about synthetic data is that link into data trust. If we can start to know that the core data is, is valid and has been well thought out and that the people who are associated to that have been informed about how that data is being brought in, and then we create the synthetic data out of that, the value and the insight into that is just going to be that much richer. So it, for me, it, it's those two go together, and that's where we'll get a lot of the richness. Excellent. And thank you for that, Krista. And I know you are a person that is always focused on impact and delivering results. So I am hopeful that we can, in this space, find a way that actually can be a showcase both to have immediate impact, sort of the examples you talked about, about improving the lives of children and actually research there, but also be a showcase to the rest of the world as to what's possible. So thank you for that, Krista. So Stuart, uh, your thoughts about two to three tweet links recommendations for world, world leaders. So let's return to the carrot aspect that I talked about earlier, I think uh, one thing that would be important would be to develop some practical carrots. This would be both in the United States and obviously countries around the world, which are in the process of devising their own legislation in this area. What are a few of these? One might be safe harbors. So if you had synthetic data, that would essentially give you a safe harbor from enforcement or from the provisions of the legislation. Another would be antitrust exemption, which would allow companies in the same uh, field to essentially get together and innovate, come up with solutions where antitrust law might currently prevent them from doing so. Uh, also tax credits, you can come up with some focused tax credits for R&D in this synthetic data area. And then another area of focus would be in the international trade field. So there are a number of trade agreements, including most recently the USMCA, which is the successor to NAFTA. And within that, there are provisions now which require Mexico, Canada, and the United States to have ongoing discussions about digital privacy. So clearly, as part of those ongoing discussions, which are required by the treaty, I think synthetic data should be put into that mix. Wow, very well said. And I think you, you underscored that, you know, it is thinking about how we can actually do the carrot model and then how we can actually use the existing treaty to actually work together with our colleagues in Canada. Maybe we should do a future geotech hour if you're open to it with our colleagues in Mexico as well to actually have that conversation and maybe be the change that we wanna have happen. But I really appreciate that, Stuart. Those were great recommendations. And so now, Stephen, you have the task of bringing it home for us. What are your two to three tweet length recommendations as we close? Yes, we can build on a couple of the, the things uh, some of these other panelists have said as well. 
you know, I think top of my mind is really focusing on the values and principles that we want to protect and promote, not the individual technologies that we're trying to push. The technologies will follow the policy if we can really hold that higher moral high ground. Um, and it, when we focus on human rights and value privacy above commerce, we can provide equity and inclusion in ways that we really haven't been able to realize before. Um, and have really been in our ethos. And, and in all of this, we need to include options for recourse or guarantees for recourse to those who are impacted by AIs, whether they realize it or not. Um, you know, maybe more specific for regulators, we should look at ways to limit liability for organizations as a carrot um, for continually improving disclosures in this space as well. So, you know, we want to be able to hold the powerful accountable. We want to be able to look at those power dynamics and we want to level that playing field a little bit more. Extremely well said. And I like to, I like the three in particular emphasizing, making sure we have the moral high ground. We think about equity and inclusion and then what can be done there. And like you said, holding the powerful accountable and also trying to figure out ways to actually make it a carrot model to move forward. So I thank you for that, Stephen. I thank you, Stuart, Krista, Jacqueline, Mike. This has been a really engaging conversation. I thanks for everything that you're doing as positive change agents and to the questions from our audience. And as, as we like to remind everyone at the close of every Geotech Hour, we hope you will be bold, be brave, and be benevolent for the future ahead. I'll see you next time.